Welcome everyone. This is Professor Richard Holizak, and this is the Entity Relationship Modeling Lecture Part 2. In Part 1, we began reviewing the database development lifecycle, including identifying an organizational problem or opportunity, gathering requirements, and then creating a conceptual data model based on those requirements. This conceptual data model is called the Entity Relationship Model. Also in Part 1, we talked about the four components of the Entity Relationship Model, including entities, which are individual collections of data, attributes, which are the properties or characteristics of an entity, identifiers, which is an attribute or attributes that uniquely determine exactly one instance of an entity, and that's where Part 1 ended. And in this part, we're going to talk about relationships. If you have not done so, I strongly recommend that you review part one of the series so that you understand entities, attributes, and identifiers very, very well. And now we can continue with relationships. You may also recall this example. We read through the following example of a human resources opportunity or problem, and we identified the entities the attributes, and the identifiers. Again, this was all covered during part one of this series. We're now going to continue this example by focusing on the relationships between these different entities. So what are relationships in the entity relationship model? Relationships show how the data interact and how the data relate to one another. There are two important concepts to understand when it comes to relationships. The first is the relationship degree. The degree is the number of entities that are involved in a relationship. And the second is relationship cardinality. And this has to do with the number of entity instances involved in a relationship. So now we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about both of these. First up, relationship degree. It's simply a fancy word for the number of entities involved in a relationship. If we look at the first example here, here's entity A and entity B, and we see a single line between them. The degree of this relationship, this line here, is two, because there are two entities involved. If we look at the next example, here's entity X, Y, and Z, we see that they are connected, entity x to y, and in turn also to z. So this relationship would have a degree of three. Entity s over here, this looks a little bit weird. It looks like it has a relationship with itself. And the degree of this relationship in red here will be a degree of one. There's only one entity involved. Nearly all of the relationships that you create in an entity relationship model will be called binary relationships, meaning that there are two entities involved in the relationship, just as you see here with entity A and B. In fact, for this lecture, we won't even consider relationships of degree three or degree one. We will use uh, a separate lecture to talk about those. So for now, just assume that there'll be two entities involved in a relationship. The next thing we want to discuss is relationship cardinality. Relationship cardinality is the number of entity instances involved in a relationship. So again, as a little review of part one of this series, an entity instance is when we give some values for each of the attributes in an entity. And what we want to know when it comes to cardinality is whether or not those instances may or must participate in the relationship, and if they do participate in the relationship, how many times can they participate? Can they just participate once, or can it be many? We call these two general categories of cardinality the minimum cardinality and the maximum cardinality. The minimum cardinality, we say it's may or must, it's optional or mandatory, does the entity instance have to participate in the relationship or can it remain on its own? The maximum cardinality answers the question, 
how many entity instances can participate in the relationship? Is it just one, or can it be more than one? I understand this sounds a little bit vague right now, but we'll do a lot of examples that will hopefully reinforce these ideas. The minimum cardinality emphasizes may or must. Is it optional to participate in the relationship, or is it mandatory? So for example, if we say this sentence, one student may be registering, that is a minimum cardinality of zero. That's the may. We could have a student who's been accepted to the university, but they haven't yet registered for courses. One diploma must be earned by. Must be. If a diploma exists, it must have been earned by, right? It's not possible that a diploma exists without a student. So here, this relationship, the minimum cardinality is must. One diploma must be earned by a student. If we look at the maximum cardinality, how many times can a student participate or register with class? So if we look at one student, we look at one student in this university, once they do register, can they just register for one class or can it be many classes? I think you'd agree that the student may be registering for many classes. There's a little bit of time after the student is accepted to the university where they haven't yet registered, but then very shortly afterwards, now the student may be registering for many classes. If we go back to the diploma, that diploma must have been earned by how many students? Only one. The diploma only applies to exactly one student. So here the maximum cardinality is one, O-N-E, one student. This is how the maximum and minimum cardinality work together to define the relationship between two entities. Here's another very, very common relationship and a set of entities that we'll see very often. A customer may be placing many orders. Wouldn't they be a customer only after they've placed an order? Well, it's possible that they've provided all of their customer information, but then decided not to place an order with us. So we say one customer may be placing many orders. If we look at it from the other direction, if we hold up an order, that order must have been placed by exactly one customer. So in this direction, one order must be placed by one and only one customer. The may or must is the minimum cardinality. The one or many is the maximum cardinality. So let's see how else we can put these together. In the unified modeling language, We've already seen that entities are displayed in a rectangle with a solid border with the name of the entity at the top. Attributes are listed within the rectangle, and identifiers are also shown within the rectangle, typically given as the first attribute with an ID in the name. In UML notation, relationships are shown with a solid line between two entities. Those lines could be vertical or horizontal, and we should take care that our relationship lines do not cross. When relationship lines cross, it makes it more difficult to read the UML diagram. Minimum cardinality is shown as either the number zero or the number one. Number zero would indicate may, number one would indicate must. The maximum cardinality is shown as either a one or an asterisk. The number one equals one, and the asterisk equals many. We use these four symbols, the zero and one, and the one and asterisk, to indicate what are the minimum and maximum cardinalities in a relationship. So now let's review our human resources example once again. And this time, let's focus on the relationships. We can see that the database should keep track of employees and the department they work for. So this is going to indicate a place for a relationship. Each employee reports to a supervisor. We're gonna skip that one for right now. Every two weeks, employees turn in a timesheet. 
So there's another case where we can look at a relationship. Paychecks are issued based on the timesheet. Now we see a third relationship. Paychecks are somehow related to timesheet. Let's see how we can arrange our entities and our relationships. Here's another arrangement of the entities, and now we've drawn the relationships with a red line here just to highlight them. The case talked about employees and the departments they work for, so employees are related to department. The case also talked about employees turning in a timesheet, so here we have employee related to timesheet. And finally, paychecks are issued based on the timesheet, so we see a relationship between paycheck and timesheet. A common question comes up, why do we not have a relationship between employee and paycheck? This is a very, very common question. After all, the paycheck will eventually go to the employee. And probably when they write out the check, the physical check, or if it's going for a direct deposit or something like that, their employee's name is going to appear on that check. And that's perfectly understandable. The reason why we don't need a relationship between employee and paycheck is because we know that the employee is the one who submitted the timesheet. And the paycheck is based on that timesheet. Therefore, we can trace back from the paycheck to the timesheet and the timesheet back to the employee. So there's no need for a direct relationship between employee and paycheck. We can make this connection by following the relationship lines. I would even go a step further. Suppose we did print out a physical paycheck and we wanted to know which department to deliver it to. We could even continue following the relationship. I have the paycheck. I know what timesheet it came from. The timesheet is associated with an employee, and that employee works for a department. Now I know which department to go and visit to give that employee their paycheck. So the relationship lines connect these entities together in a way that lets us connect the data. Now let's focus on relationship cardinalities. We're going to start by looking at one relationship at a time. And in the first case, we're interested in the fact that an employee works for one department. So in order to indicate this, we're going to put the number one here. We're going to say this employee works for one department. The number one means at most one department. Going the other direction, a department can have many employees working in it. I think that makes sense. Usually, when we think about a company, that company has many departments, and within that department, there's going to be more than one employee. So there we're going to use the asterisk. Now, you may be interested in why the cardinality appears on the opposite side. This is a feature for UML. Whenever we talk about an entity, in this case employee, and we want to discuss its cardinality, we make this jump all the way to the other side of the relationship line, and that's the cardinality we look at with relationship to department. So one employee must be working for one department. An employee can only work for a maximum of one department. Going the other direction, a department can have many employees working in it. So we start off looking at it from the side of department, one department, and then we again jump over to the other side of the relationship line and we say one department, many employees. Just as a reminder in UML notation, the number one means one and the asterisk means many. So this is how we start off talking about maximum cardinality. What about minimum cardinality? If we have an employee, that employee cannot just be floating around in space. They must be working in a department. We don't just hire an employee and not have them report anywhere to work. We hire that employee and they must be working in one department. Again, in the UML notation, we put the number one to mean must be, and then we put two dots 
and then we put the number one, meaning one department. So it's the minimum cardinality, and then two dots, and then the maximum cardinality. Looking at it from the other direction, we say one department may be staffed with many employees. Now that sounds kind of interesting. One department may be staffed with many employees. Well, we've already talked about the maximum cardinality. It's pretty common that one department might have three people or five people or 10 people working there. But what's the story with the maybe here? Why could we have a department without anyone working there? I can think of a couple of reasons. The first is maybe when the company is just getting started, perhaps they don't have a marketing department. Maybe they got started and they had human resources, they had an operations department, they had a finance department, but they didn't yet have a marketing department. First, we have to create the department. We have to create a new marketing department. And for a brief moment in time, there may not be any employees working there. So one department may be staffed with many employees. Very soon after, maybe even the next day, now that the marketing department has been created, now we can start hiring employees or transferring employees into that department. But this number zero here, this may be is very important because it allows us to create the department first and then start to add employees later on. And I'll come back and try and reinforce this point a little bit later in the lecture. It's always important to have at least one side of the relationship show this optional maybe. Okay, let's take a look at the relationship between employee and timesheet. One employee may be submitting many timesheets. All right, again, we see this maybe. Why is this minimum cardinality may? Because when an employee is first hired, they usually have to work one or two weeks before they can submit a timesheet. You don't hire an employee on the first day and immediately they turn in a timesheet. It might take a couple of weeks before they turn in their first timesheet. So this is why the minimum cardinality is zero. Once the employee turns in a timesheet, then they'll work another two weeks and turn in another timesheet, and they'll work some more and turn in more timesheets. So over time, they will end up turning in many timesheets, and that's the reason for the asterisk. Again, remember, we always begin with the entity, and then we jump over to the other side. So one employee may be, that's the zero here, submitting many timesheets, that's the asterisk. Going the other direction, if we have a timesheet, if you walked into the break room at work and you saw a piece of paper sitting on the table and it had the word timesheet written at the top of it, who would that timesheet belong to? That timesheet must belong to exactly one employee. Multiple employees don't turn in the same timesheet. A timesheet must be filled in or submitted by exactly one employee. We don't have timesheets that are just floating around not associated with an employee, and we certainly only have timesheets that are associated with exactly one employee. So this side is mandatory. The first number one is mandatory, and the second number one means exactly one. So one timesheet must be submitted by exactly one employee. Now we're talking about the third relationship, the relationship between timesheet and paycheck. Here we're saying one timesheet may be paid with one paycheck, or it could even be many paychecks. And this could be an area where you might have some debate. It sort of makes sense that you turn in a timesheet, the employee that is, turns in a timesheet, the accounting department or the payroll department takes the hours, multiplies out your hourly rate, and creates a paycheck. And then they hand over that paycheck or they do a direct deposit. So I can certainly agree with one timesheet may be paid with one paycheck. However, 
maybe we have a situation where the paycheck gets lost or the employee somehow misplaces it or it goes through the laundry or something like that. And then the payroll department might have to issue a replacement paycheck. If that's the case, then maybe this should say one time sheet may be paid with more than one paycheck. So this gives us a little bit more flexibility. Again, why do we say maybe? Because the timesheet first has to be turned in, and then the paycheck will be created. Once a paycheck is created, it must have been created from one and only one timesheet. Again, this is an assumption of the business. One paycheck per timesheet. You turn in a timesheet, we create a paycheck based on it. Again, these are areas where there could be some debate. Depending on how your company works, it could be that a paycheck is based off of multiple timesheets. So it really does come down to the assumptions of the business. And this is often where we have to go back to the business users and ask them clarifying questions. Remember, we did spend some time gathering requirements, and this is the kind of thing that might be a detail that we didn't necessarily learn from the users when we first interviewed them, when we were gathering requirements. So keep that in mind. It's possible we have to go back and get some clarification on these. Now we have our relationship cardinalities completed. We see that there are three relationships. Each relationship is of degree two, because there's only two entities involved. And each one of these is what we call a one-to-many relationship. One department, many employees. One employee, many timesheets. One timesheet, many paychecks. Now I want to talk about another cool thing that we can do with a UML diagram when we're creating this entity relationship model. We can add little verb phrases. Usually they're quite short. And we write these along the lines of each relationship. And we can use these to create relationship sentences. I've already talked a little bit about them and given some examples. Whenever we write a relationship sentence, we begin with the word one, O-N-E. Always start off your relationship sentence with the word one, O-N-E, and then give the name of an entity. So one customer, something, something, something. One employee, one vendor, one product, one student. Always begin with the word one, followed by the name of an entity. So let's take a look at some examples of how we could do this. Department and employee. One department, maybe, maybe is the zero here, staffed by many employees. Notice we're going to use maybe or must be here. Okay, the B is helpful because it really causes you to be very careful about your choice of verb phrase. Now we'll go the other direction. One employee must be assigned to one department. The first number one here means must be, and the second number one here is assigned to one department. So I've actually put the cardinalities in parentheses here so that you can connect them. So what are we using? A minimum cardinality of zero, use maybe. A minimum cardinality of one, use must be. And then for the maximum cardinality, we'll either use one or many. This is a pattern that you can follow. One entity name, and then either maybe or must be, your verb phrase, and then either one or many, and then another entity name. So one department may be staffed by many employees. One employee must be working in one department. Let's look at another example. Here's the relationship between employee and timesheet. One employee may be submitting many timesheets. The first number zero here is the maybe, 
and the asterisk means many. So one employee may be submitting many timesheets. Now we go in the opposite direction. Remember, we always begin with the word one and then the name of an entity. One timesheet must be submitted by one employee. One timesheet must be, that's the first one, submitted by is our verb phrase, and then at most, one employee. The maximum cardinality here is one. And here's the third relationship. One timesheet may be paid with many paychecks. And going the other direction, one paycheck must be, that's the first number one, one paycheck must be created from one timesheet. And again, all of these relationships are considered one to many. You have one on the one side, maximum cardinality, and many. One employee, many timesheets, one timesheet, many paychecks. Now it's your turn. Write down the relationship sentences for these relationships. We'll pause the video, or you can pause the video for a few minutes, jot down your answers, and then when we resume, we'll look at what some of these sentences mean. Okay, first relationship is between vendors and purchase orders. And here we're going to say, one vendor may be receiving many purchase orders. Now let's think about that for a minute. One vendor may be receiving many purchase orders. In order to send a purchase order out, we have to have a vendor. But it's possible we may sign up a vendor, we may get their contact information and their address and their phone number and all of that, but for whatever reason we haven't yet sent them a purchase order. So it's possible we have some vendors that have not yet received purchase orders. That's why this first zero means maybe, the minimum cardinality of zero, may be receiving many purchase orders. Once a purchase order is created, we say one purchase order must be submitted to one vendor. So it makes sense that if we're creating a purchase order, it can only be submitted to one vendor. In fact, it must be submitted to a vendor. We wouldn't submit it somewhere else. We wouldn't submit it to a, a customer or directly to a warehouse or something. It must be submitted to a vendor. Looking at the relationship between products and purchase order items, we're gonna say here one product may be ordered on many purchase order items. We think about what a purchase order looks like. We've got the purchase order information at the top. We sometimes call that purchase order header information. And then we have a collection of items that are related to it. So one product may be ordered on many purchase order items. It's possible we have a product that we've never ordered yet. That's fine. That's why the first number here, the minimum cardinality is a zero. Once we have a purchase order item, it must be an order for one and only one product. So each line item on a purchase order is associated with exactly one product. In fact, it must be associated with exactly one product. Finally, a purchase order may be made up of many purchase order items. This is gonna sound weird. How can we have a purchase order without any items on it, without any line items. Well, again, there needs to be a moment in time where we create the purchase order header. That includes the purchase order date, the required delivery date, the payment terms, all of the other things that would go into the header of this purchase order. And once that's created, then we can start adding purchase order items. It's very similar to when you're visiting a website and you have to log in and create your user profile before you start adding items to your shopping cart. So we have to have that purchase order header and then we can see the collection of items. So one purchase order may be made up of many 
purchase order items. Once we have a purchase order item, it must be an item on one and only one purchase order. So that item, which contains that product, the quantity ordered, the quantity actually delivered, the item price, the item discount, that must be associated with exactly one purchase order. Again, these are all considered one-to-many relationships, and I think what you will find is the vast majority of the time, your relationships will be one-to-many. Now let me talk a little bit about many-to-many -many relationships, and this again is a very common situation. Here we have a vendor that may be supplying many products, and a product that may be supplied by many vendors. We call this kind of a relationship a many-to-many -many relationship, looking at the maximum cardinalities. So one product may be supplied by one or more vendors, one vendor may be supplying one or more products. What about adding an attribute like cost? So we have this product that we're ordering from a vendor, and we want to know how much does the vendor charge us for this? Where does an attribute like cost belong? Well, it doesn't really belong in the product itself because that product is supplied by many different vendors. Therefore, each vendor could charge us a different cost. The attribute cost doesn't really belong with vendor because they may supply us with many different products and each product they're going to charge a different amount. Attribute cost really doesn't fit inside of product, it doesn't fit inside of vendor. It's really an attribute that describes what happens when vendor and product come together. If vendor ABC supplies product 101, they might charge $10. If vendor XYZ supplies product 101, they might charge $11. So it's really something that happens when two entities come together. When vendor and product come together, we get an attribute called cost. And the way to model this is to introduce what's sometimes called an intersection entity or an associative entity. It's an entity that sits in the middle of what used to be a many-to-many relationship. Notice our many-to-many -many relationship is gone now. And now we have this thing in the middle. I called it characteristics, but you can really give it just about any name. You could call it vendor product if you wanted to. And this is where we get attributes that make sense or are associated with both entities. So now you pick a vendor and you pick a product and you can say things about the cost of that. The lead time, how long will it take the vendor to deliver that particular product? And the mean time to failure, right, MTTF. For that vendor, what's the mean time before the product fails? Maybe something like a hard drive or a processor or something like that. These characteristics only make sense when you talk about the combination of a vendor and a product. And notice the relationships between vendor and characteristics and product and characteristics are one to many. One vendor may be supplying products with many characteristics. One product may be supplied by a vendor with many characteristics. So these become one to many relationships. In effect, we've taken the many-to-many -many relationship, and we've rewritten it as two separate one-to-many relationships. This will actually work quite reliably. In any model, if you have a many-to-many -many relationship, here I'm showing one between entity X and entity Y, this can always be rewritten as two separate one-to-many relationships with something in the middle. Again, we sometimes call this an intersection entity or an associative entity. This entity doesn't really make sense by itself. 
but it does when it's related to two normal entities on either side. This substitution can always be made. And notice the original many-to-many -many relationship is gone. It's replaced by this new structure, the associative entity with two one-to-many relationships. All right, now it's your turn. Fill in the cardinalities and verb phrases for the following model. And here are some assumptions. By the way, if you are creating a model for yourself and you are given the case study, if there is something that is not clear, you should write down what your assumptions are. It's important that we cover our bases with our assumptions here. These I've already given. Assumptions are that students may double major. Students may participate in many clubs. However, students can only rent one locker. So again, I invite you to pause the video, see if you can jot down what you think the cardinalities and verb phrases ought to be. And when we resume, we will look at some ideas. Okay. Remember our assumptions. Students may double major, students may participate in many clubs, but they can only rent one locker. Your results may vary. This is probably the first time that many of you are going through this, so it is completely understandable if you got something totally different. But let's talk through the logic behind this. Here we have a student who may be declaring many majors. Why? Because students can double major. Yes, it says many. Anything more than one, we're going to put the asterisk. So you might say, gee, can students triple major or can they have five majors? At this level in the database, yes, that's certainly possible. There may be something in the application that will prevent that, but for now, anything more than one, we have to model as many. So one student may be declaring many majors. Going the other direction, one major may be declared by many students. And I think that makes sense going in that direction. One major may be declared by many students. Let's take a look at the student club relationship. One club may be attended by many students and one student may be participating in many clubs. I think this makes sense. Obviously, a club will have many students signed up for it, and one student may be participating in a club. Why do we say minimum cardinality of zero here? Because it's possible that a student doesn't want to participate in any clubs, and that's fine because we have a zero here as the minimum cardinality. It's also possible that when a club is first created, it doesn't yet have any students signed up for it. So we give that little bit of room here where a club can be created without any students in it. Finally, let's look at the relationship between student and locker. One student may be renting one locker. So here we have a restriction. A student doesn't have to rent a locker, but if they do, they're only allowed to rent one locker. Apparently lockers are in short supply, so it's only fair that the most a student can do is rent one locker. From the other perspective, one locker may be rented by one student. Maybe there's a locker somewhere that no one has rented yet, and that's fine. That's why the first minimum cardinality here is zero. Once a student rents a locker, it can only be one student. We wouldn't want to rent that locker to more than one student. Take a look at these, rewind the video if you like, and review these relationships. Student and major is many to many. Student and club is many to many. Student and locker is a one to one relationship. Now it's your turn again. Write out the relationship sentences. We've already talked through them a little bit, but it's good practice to go ahead and go through those different relationship sentences. Feel free to pause the video, write down some answers, and when you're done, go ahead and resume the video.
Okay, here we go. One student may be declaring many majors. One major may be declared by many students. One student may be renting one locker. One locker may be rented by one student. One student may be participating in many clubs. And one club may be attended by many students. Hopefully that is relatively straightforward based on the discussion of the prior slides. Now we've got a couple of details here to look at when you are working on the relationships in your ER model. The first one to be aware of is we need to be careful about mandatory one-to-one -one relationships. And what do we mean by that? Where the first minimum cardinality here is a one and the maximum cardinality is a one. When we have that on both sides of the relationship, what this means is you cannot have an entity instance y without exactly one x. And you cannot have an x without exactly one y. In other words, x and y are probably two sets of attributes that are really describing the same thing if you cannot have one without the other. Here's an example. I have a customer with a customer ID, first name, last name, street, city, state, zip code, and we have some measurements, the shirt collar size, sleeve length, chest, waist, hip, and inseam. These are all measurements for clothing. We're saying here a customer must have exactly one set of measurements, and one set of measurements must apply to exactly one customer. You cannot have one without the other. A customer must have measurements, and measurements must be associated with a customer. This is no good. This is a, not a good sign. What we should do then is combine these two into one entity. And now we have all of the attributes under one entity. So anytime you see a mandatory one-to-one, -one, combine those two entities together into one big entity. Here's another thing to keep in mind. At least one side of a relationship has to be zero. It has to be optional. If we have entities A and B, and the first minimum cardinality here is a one, this means that if an A exists, there must be a B. The problem is in the other direction, this number one minimum cardinality says there cannot be a B without an A. So now the question is, which comes first, A or B? You cannot have an A because you have to have a B to match up with it, and you cannot have a B because you must have an A that matches up with it. So this will never work in the database. This is not good. At least one side should be a zero. Okay, and the example that we gave is one customer may be placing an order. An order must be placed by one and only one customer. So at least one side of the relationship must be a zero for the minimum cardinality. Okay, it's your turn again. Which of the following relationships are acceptable in an ER model? Look at relationship A, B between C and D, E and F, G and H, I and J, and K and L. Go ahead and pause the video and write down which of these relationships you think are acceptable in an ER model. When we resume, we'll look at the details. Okay, it looks like the top three are really not going to work for us. A and B, they have the problem where both sides have a minimum cardinality of one, and that cannot work. In relationship C and D, we see that the one side of the relationship is optional, whereas the many side is mandatory. The problem here is that we're saying if you have a C, you must have one or more Ds. But if you have a D, it's optional as to whether or not you have a C. And so that's not going to work. The many side should have a zero here, and the one side should be mandatory. In relationship E and F, 
this is kind of nonsensical because we see the asterisk in the first position here. Remember, the asterisk will only appear for the maximum cardinality, either a one or an asterisk. You would never have an asterisk for a minimum cardinality. So these top three would not be permitted in an ER model. The bottom three will. Here's relationship GH. This is the classic one to many. The one side has mandatory one dot dot one. The many side has optional zero dot dot asterisk. Relationship IJ. This is a classic one to one relationship where if you have a J, you must have an I, but if you have an I, it's optional as to whether or not you have a J. At least one or both sides of this relationship should be zero. And then finally, K and L. This is a classic many-to-many -many relationship where you have a K and you may have many Ls. If you have an L, you may have many Ks. So these three, G, H, I, J, and K, L, are all acceptable in an ER model. Let's summarize. In part one of this video series, you learned about entities, attributes, and identifiers. And now in this video, we've discussed relationships. We talked about the degree of a relationship. We've talked about the cardinality of relationships, including minimum and maximum cardinalities. So far, we've only discussed relationships of degree two, and that is relationships where only two entities are involved. In UML notation, we looked at the way we show the minimum cardinality as a zero or a one, and the maximum cardinality as a one or an asterisk. And the three classic types of relationships we discussed are one-to-many, one-to-one, and many-to-many. -many. In any ER model, the vast majority of the relationships are going to be many-to-many. -many. I would say 85, even 90%. There'll be a handful, maybe one or two, relationships that are one-to-one, -one, and maybe another handful that are many-to-many. -many. Most of the time, we're going to have one-to-many relationships in our ER model. So that concludes the material for part two. Stay tuned for part three, where we will talk about additional types of relationships.